back again. And uh, what are we doing today? Well, we're going to play with some radiation. Oh dear, scary stuff. But maybe not so scary. Um, I get a lot of people that I come across in my daily life that don't understand the difference between ionizing radiation and electromagnetic radiation, or aka non-ionizing radiation. And they don't really get how all this stuff works. So I thought I'd do a quick little video to demonstrate this. Now, this here is an electromagnetic radiation tester. It's a cheap Chinese one. And it's uh, not really what I'd call calibrated. This, however, is a fairly expensive um, Russian-made Geiger counter that is well calibrated. This thing over here is a, um, a kit Geiger counter that's probably about as calibrated as this. So um, I thought I'd demonstrate a few things. For a start, let's get a baseline. This thing likes to beep at me about everything. Um, largely because I run DC through most of my bench and uh, that gives me uh, a static magnetic field which uh, on this meter here, if we turn the backlight on this is a static magnetic field measured in micro tesla let's shut this stupid beep off okay that's for fixed magnetic fields this is for electromagnetic fields let's grab a big a rare earth magnet here, this one here and let's just demonstrate that, we'll put a magnet near it and this will max out see it's just gone over limit there uh, because I've got a fixed magnet right near the top if we give it a bit of time to recover, <laughs> it'll probably go back to registering stuff. But um, that's a pretty static field. So while we're doing this, let's just shut down some extra components on my desk, and we'll go on to um, go on to minimum running lights. I think we have an appropriate. I think the red cycle doesn't seem to upset it too much, or not. This is going to keep flashing at me all the way through. So let's. Um, go back to these lights, I think that has an inverter which actually messes it up not much difference anyway, you get a feel for the average background in here and you know there's zero EM field we have this uh, small DC motor now you'll notice at the moment because it also has fixed magnets um, this will be detecting a bit of static magnetic field although it's a bit difficult for it to measure, this thing's always been a little unstable on that side what you get for a cheap meter. But crucially you'll notice the volts per square meter reading is reading zero. So let's park this right up here where I know the sensor is and uh, we will fire it up. You'll notice our volts per square meter is starting to rise. That's because we have an actual electromagnetic field now created by something that's running and it's putting off an alternating magnetic field pulsing at least, which is pretty much what square wave is. It's a pulsing DC magnetic field. Well, I guess that depends on your reference to ground, but everybody will argue it. Anyway, now we've turned the motor off. All of a sudden, we have uh, zero volts per square meter. So, now that we've got the obvious bit out of the way, let's take a piece of uranium glass and park it next to this thing. Now you would remember our baseline, this is set as an average, that's not really changing. There's no volts per square meter, nothing's happening. So let's take some thoriated tungsten electrodes, some tips off some welding rods here. Again, no real change on the average from the fixed magnetic field. Now let's take a uh, one microcurie of americium for a smoke alarm, put that up against this. Again, no volts per square meter, no electromagnetic radiation, which is what we would expect. Let's go on to the good stuff now. Okay, so firstly we need to shut the beeper off, because we know that it thinks everything's dangerous. Now let's move all our samples out of the way for a minute, and get a baseline in here. Now, there is a little bit of background radiation. Um, that you'll hear from time to time. Let's turn this other one on as well. And we'll change our angle. So, this is just registering average background radiation. And uh, like that, there's usually a little bit of background EMF as well. 
um, because radio stations and cosmic stuff and a whole manner of things I'm not going to take the time to uh, measure. Anyway, I know with this guy can counter here, if we shunt back a little bit, the tube is right on this side. So we're going to stick our magnet to it to the point where it drags the counter around. And you notice there's no real change in the baseline. Same as if I go over here. Now if I wave a magnet past, that can um, invoke a little bit of electromagnetic induction through there. But generally, that doesn't do anything to it. If I park our fixed magnet over here, this meter goes off the charts. So, let's actually see if we get that near the center so we demonstrate that. There we go, we're looking at like 9 point something, 18 micro teslas there for a minute and it just went off the scale. Clearly reacts to a fixed magnetic field. So let's take a piece of uranium glass and we'll spin this round so the tube can sit next to it. Now we've got a bit of reaction happening here. And we can see here that this tube and this tube are both registering something. But if we take this away, we park this one here, we light it up again, we get nothing. Nothing on the volts per square meter. So yeah, really nothing at all. Nothing above the background there. So let's move this way. We'll find something slightly hotter. Let's try our thoriated tungsten electrodes here. Now we're getting a bit of bit of action out of it. Let's punch it next to this. Now that's certainly a bit more radioactive. Let's put this over next to this meter. And again, no volts per square meter. Nothing more than what my normal background field is producing. So uh, let's try one more sample we have kicking around here, which is our smoke alarm. This is the americium again. Again, we've checked on that field. Let's stick it over this one. So we can see our blue lights flashing a bit faster. Bring that into view a bit better. Let's put it near the noisy one. We can certainly hear that there's actually some radiation detected here. Now, I'll have a quick talk about why this is different. Now we're finished mucking around with all this. Let's turn off all our noisy stuff. Okay, so this might not strictly gel with everybody's definitions and agreements of it, but I'm oversimplifying stuff just to get the general message out. Electromagnetic radiation, good, or not bad at least. Ionizing radiation is the bad stuff. If you don't want to listen to the rest of the description, that's basically my message here. Anyway, let's get a bit more detailed in this. So, Electromagnetic radiation of the type that you'll see from your Wi-Fi access point, your mobile phone, an electric motor, your Apple Watch, all that sort of stuff is very unlikely to be dangerous to you and there's literally little to no research that supports any feeling that it's dangerous to you. Ionizing radiation on the other hand, there's a whole host of history and proven studies and demonstrable, repeatable science that says that, that is dangerous. With a slight caveat. Now, alpha particles, they're not actually, or alpha and beta particles are basically not considered to be part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, even though they technically are, well, gamma rays and x-rays are technically electromagnetic radiation, but there's an exception with that. Now, alpha particles, they're very, very low energy. You'd be hard-pressed to see them push through a sheet of paper or your skin. Unless you ingest an alpha particle emitter, like you actually physically swallow it, not likely to be a danger to you. And uh, so some things um, like uh, strontium-90, for instance, which there's a history of that getting into the food chain, um, namely from Maralinga nuclear tests, um, that will build up in places like your bones replacing calcium. Um, other stuff like thorium, if you ingest it, can build up in your thyroid glands, giving you um, thyroid problems and cancers. 
Now, beta particles are sort of the medium strength particle. They can punch through a few things, but generally not a huge danger to you. Gamma rays are the nasty ones, and so are X-rays. But they are very, very high energy photons, if you will. Um, and they can punch through a lot of things, like a meter of concrete. Um, and they're very, very dangerous. Um, however, that being said, you've got to be exposed to a lot of it for a long period of time to do your damage, or an extreme amount of it for a very short period of time. Uh, for instance, you'll see one of my previous videos where my wife was injected with technetium, if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, and that's a very short half-life gamma emitter. Um, and she was radioactive beyond the reading scale of my multi or my Geiger counters uh, for about 12 hours. And then for the remaining two to three days, she still had detectable levels above background in her system. Um, that amount of exposure still amounts to an international flight, like, you know, 10 hours or eight hours or so above 30,000 feet. Um, so it's not really over that short space of time you've got time to recover. Basically how this works is it's like having a whole bunch of little tiny bullets shot through you. They're so tiny they only do a damage to a few cells on the way through. But with lots and lots and lots of that happening every second, you're damaging a lot of cells. And so if you don't allow yourself time to recover and regrow those cells, um, that's when you start to have real problems. You essentially end up with your body perforated and shot full of tiny little holes. Um, and people basically dissolve, for lack of a better description, under extremely high levels of radiation and they don't recover. Now there's a few other exceptions to this and I'll go on to them in a moment. I'll take a moment here to reference X-rays which are in the same category as gamma radiation and uh, again when you have a, an X-ray they expose you to a, quite a significantly high amount of radiation but for a bre very brief moment uh, and that gives your body time to recover. Now the quirk in all of this and why people, there's the stories of like mutations and cancers and stuff like that from radiation exposure how that mechanism works is if you each time you damage a cell there's a risk that the cell could regrow malformed and if that cell regrows malformed it can replicate in that state and that's when you end up with a cancer growing it's a whole bunch of cells that are re damaged cells that are regrowing in that same damaged state it's not strictly the correct definition for this or explanation but that's more or less what's going on um, so basically, the longer you're exposed to those things, the greater the chance you got of a cell going wrong. Um, but there is radiation in our daily lives, both electromagnetic and ionizing radiation. Most of the background levels of radiation you'll see around you, uh, ionizing radiation specifically, uh, are coming from either cosmic rays or they're coming from radioactive materials in the Earth or other people. They're slightly radioactive. Uh, and your table salt, I think it's about 0.1% or something of that, will be will have a radioactive sodium isotope in it. Um, it's just naturally occurring. Um, the oil production process, they have a term called NORM, which is naturally occurring radioactive material. You'll find if you're near uh, an oil uh, stabilization plant, you'll probably find that they have a yard somewhere with um, pipe fittings that are labelled with big tape that says NORM. Um, because of like the sand and the junk and everything that comes up with crude oil, they have T pieces um, and like elbows in pipes, and they wear out with a through abrasion. And they have a particular way of solving that called a targeted T, where they have a pipe that goes around an elbow, and they have a little hole in the back here, or, or a little piece of tube off the back. The idea there is that builds up sediment. My apprentice is currently jumping. So sorry about the background noise. In the back of this tube, um, all the sand and crap and junk that goes through the pipe builds up in there and that becomes a surface for it to erode on. Now, the same way that you find gold is the same way you can find radioactive particles. They tend to be very dense and heavy. So that means that in these targeted T's, um, they tend to build up sediment 
so they build up radioactive stuff it's very heavy so fairly regularly they need to replace these materials so they, they replace these teas because they become contaminated and uh, usually they store them in a big yard for years and years and years until they pay a company to go and dispose of them properly as is my understanding of it anyway um, when I worked in that industry I never did ask where the norm contaminated stuff went so that's a bit outside my field of experience okay so in summary I'm not going to yak all day this is meant to be a short video basically if you go out and you start licking the radium paint off an old radium dialed clock it's probably a really bad idea and it almost certainly is going to make you sick in some way however talking for a couple of hours on your mobile phone is not going to cause you a problem the exception to this that somebody somewhere because this is YouTube somebody's going to point out if you do something silly like climb up a communications tower and muck around in front of one of those high energy microwave dishes where they've got a large amount of electromagnetic radiation focused and directed onto a single point or a narrow beam you're probably going to boil your brain there are some exceptions in frequency which is uh, what makes a big difference here so your microwaves that are at about 2.5 gigahertz or a smidgen under that there's a resonant frequency of moisture older Wi-Fi is 2.4 gigahertz and might sound like it's a close frequency but there's a big jump between the two and uh, try as I might I've never been able to boil an egg with Wi-Fi even at like 5 watts so uh, and I think in Australia it's capped at like 250 milliwatts way below that so basically don't freak out about Wi-Fi and mobile phones and electric motors and little things like that are not going to hurt you however if somebody comes home with a pile of crushed uranium glass like some of the stuff that I've got hiding over here and starts blowing it around the room you've got certainly got reason to be concerned so be concerned where it's worth being concerned um, I have a lot of people that panic about some of the things I do and they seem to be a little bit concerned about my cavalier approach to radiation it's not without taking precautions and I do a lot of homework too but I realise that short exposures to some of the small samples that I have are unlikely to cause me a problem and I have the correct equipment to test if it's likely to I'm going in for an MRI because uh, I've got multiple sclerosis I have to do that nearly every six months when they put me through an MRI they give me technetium uh, trace and I'm radioactive I do my probably my six month or my yearly dose of radiation in two or three days far more than I'm ever going to be exposed to from a little piece of uranium glass or a bit of a chunk of amorism out of a smoke alarm it's just not going to happen so that's basically look like me flying to the states to the USA from Australia you know a couple of times a year I think you know 15 and a half hours above 30,000 feet is probably a reasonably high radiation exposure so yeah don't freak out about electromagnetic radiation it's not as bad as you think anyway this has been a short rant I like my rants as you know and uh, I'd be horribly shocked if anybody is seeing the end of this video so if you are thank you and uh, by all means put your two cents worth in on this one but unlike the Amiga videos keep it clean if you can't make a comment without insulting me just don't leave a comment you know just keep it to yourself guys otherwise have at it i'm happy to have constructive conversations see you in the next one